All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brooke Dewar from the Penn State Law Center for Agricultural and Shale Law. Today, we're going to begin our legal planning for specialty crop producers webinar series. Uh, that webinar series is essentially six parts, and there will be a couple of extra supplemental portions, which we'll discuss here. But before we begin with Topic one of our specialty crop producers legal planning series. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the Ag Law Center itself. Here's a slide that tells you uh, what our building looks like. This is the Penn State Law School on the campus, and we're more or less across from the football stadium. Here's some uh, information with regard to the uh, contact information for the uh, center. And uh, uh, most importantly, our website address is here. This is our center staff. Uh, Ross Piper is, of course, our director and uh, faculty at the law school. Uh, we have a research assistant named Chloe Marie, uh, who um, helps us out with a lot of the materials that are existing on our website. Uh, I'm Brooke Dewar, again, a staff attorney here. Some of you might know me. I worked at the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture for many, many years in the legal office. And also Jackie Schweikler is a staff attorney here at the center. Jackie is going to do the presentation today uh, on uh, legal liabilities relevant to inviting third parties onto your farm premises. This is probably the most important thing we want to get across to you, which is come to our website and check out the materials that we have there available for you. And some of you probably have been there since you registered for this webinar. You would have probably done that through the website, even if you didn't know you were in there. Uh, in any event, we have a banner across the top. Each one of these is a drop down menu um, that tells you about the center, lists all of our events like this kind of event, uh, lists publications, lists research by topic, uh, a watch or listen uh, tab uh, enables you to look at webinars that we've done in the past and also listen to our podcasts. We have a mediation center and a legal clinic. I'll talk about the mediation center uh, in a second. Uh, here are also sort of a listing of many of the things that we do at the Ag Law Center. Uh, the, one of the featured items that we uh, have is the weekly review, which is a uh, weekly review of legal developments in the ag world that goes out uh, weekly and is available on our website at any time. And you can sign up to receive that by an email distribution. Our mediation program is something that we'd like to make sure people are aware of. If you have uh, disputes with USDA relating to USDA programs, that was what the mediation program was originally designed to handle. However, it is now also available for non-USDA program disputes, things such as property line disputes with a neighbor or other types of disputes that you may have. In other words, it's a, it's a chance to try to resolve legal matters in a forum that won't involve uh, expensive legal proceedings, hopefully. And Jackie Schweikler, who you'll be meeting in a moment, is the one who conducts uh, and administers the mediation uh, program, I should say. We hire uh, third-party mediators to do the mediation itself. And again, this is a voluntary program. Both sides must agree to mediate their dispute, uh, but it's a USDA program that um, uh, is fully funded by USDA. The mediator's fees are all covered by USDA. Uh, so theoretically, if you don't have uh, other costs like an attorney that you might have involved, uh, you can do this uh, at no cost and participate in the mediation program. Uh, we have podcasts. They're available at all the normal uh, places where you get podcasts. Uh, a lot of our programs are uh, funded in different ways by uh, the USDA National Ag Library, uh, by the National Agricultural Law Center and by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. However, this particular program is funded by Pennsylvania Specialty Crop Block Grant Program, which is ultimately USDA funding from uh, USDA Ag Marketing Service and then distributed by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. So uh, we're very grateful for that. And that's what has enabled us to bring you this programming. As I said before, this is Legal Planning for Specialty Crop Producers. Uh, our subtitle for this entire series is Understanding Liability Protections, Regulatory Processes, and Other Legal Risks. And we're here to try to bring you some degree of legal education and sensitize you and educate you about particular legal issues that uh, you hopefully uh, will 
put to good use in your in your uh, ag operation, but uh, perhaps not have to see uh, uh, the legal result of, or you won't have to see an adverse legal uh, uh, action taken because you've adopted some of these uh, measures. Uh, this will be, again, six substantive topics that are going to be presented throughout the course of 2022. And um, the idea is to provide you with tools to uh, deal with liabilities that might arise from the kind of augment in income augmenting activities that uh, have become so vital to specialty crop producers, like direct sales, pick your own, value added processing, and various kind of agritourism, agritainment, or educational activities that you might get engaged in. Now, a couple of things about this series. I want to go through the topics just so you get an idea as to the, gen the, the, the scope of what we're going to talk about. Today is the uh, liability risks from business invitees on your farm, which means your customers or someone who might come to, let's say, an agritourism event. The second topic will be on March 23rd, and we'll talk about essentially liabilities that can arise from the sale of your products. In other words, once this one today is about when people come to your farm, the next one will be about when they leave your farm and they take product with them uh, and what liabilities can uh, arise from that or if you ship product to them. Uh, in other words, it's going to be sort of a course on products liability. Uh, that'll certainly be a big part of it. And we'll talk about insurance, et cetera, uh, for that act, those kinds of activities. Uh, third topic, we'll be uh, talking all about business structures for your actual operation that provide liability protections in and of themselves, um, such as corporations, LLCs, et cetera. Um, so that's another angle on liability uh, avoidance and liability protections. Uh, the, they're going to have a session at Ag Progress Days that's going to be sort of a review and also a feedback session where we would like to get some feedback on uh, how is the series working and how uh, can we make it better as we go forward. Then we're going to kick in in the uh, fall of 2022 into the second three segments. Uh, segment four will be all about licensing and regulatory requirements and obligations from getting into selling raw and processed specialty crop products. In other words, all of your licensing duties with the PA Department of Agriculture and labeling issues and, and all of that sort of thing that you would need to know uh, on the regulatory end. Uh, and then the fifth topic will be all about municipal law and zoning in order to get approvals for the things that you'd like to do at your particular location, whether they be agritainment or whether they might be direct sales. Um, and of course, we've all encountered uh, the problems there, or if you've gotten into this, you're probably aware of how many hoops there is, or there are, I should say, to jump uh, with regard to township type approvals. Uh, last substantive topic is going to be all about the laws that exist in Pennsylvania that in one way or another provide some protections for you in your operation, such as uh, the right to farm law or what's called the acre uh, statute in Pennsylvania. And we'll talk about clean, clean and green, which is just a way to essentially facilitate your business by saving you on uh, property taxes. So we'll talk about a number of those kind of programs. Uh, and then we're going to have a final recap at next year's PASA convention, uh, again, for feedback and, uh, and sort of review of the entire series to date. Feedback is a big part of what we're trying to get from you through participation in this series. We'd like for people to participate in all, all uh, six substantive topics of the series. Uh, we are going to be soliciting input from you regularly through emails, and the, our, our touch point, so to speak, will be July 2022, October 2022, and then January 2023, I should say there. Let me correct that. And... Um, uh, that at that point, we really like for people to give us substantive feedback on what they've learned and what they're doing, first of all, in terms of income supplementing activities, what they've learned, what they intend to implement, and if they have implemented things, uh, and just generally give us some good, hard data on whether what we're attempting to accomplish through this series is, in fact, being accomplished. Um, 
uh, it's an important for the uh, funding stream that is bringing you all of this programming, but it's also important for us on an individual basis. We're very happy to talk with you uh, about some of the things that you learn here more in depth if you want to contact us uh, and try to help you to implement some of these things. Um, the registration for this uh, process, again, goes through our website and you can register at any particular time. We'd like to see people spread the word about this series. It's not mandatory that you uh, attend all six and any amount of attendance that you, and contribution you can make is great. We'd like to see people uh, participate in all six and you can do that by access to recordings of the webinars as we conduct them and record them. They will be made available to those who register so that you can catch up on things you may have missed. And if somebody has missed the first two, they can still catch up by registering and uh, watching the, the previous sessions. We like to have them think that they're going to build on each other, but um, we know that people's schedules don't always allow that kind of sequential participation. Uh, at the end of it all, registrants are going to receive a, a complimentary copy of the curriculum prepared uh, as essentially a publication format. Um, and uh, that way it'll hopefully help you in your business uh, in the future. Um, all right, last thing is just we have a web page on our website that is exclusively devoted to this particular series. And here's the link up above. Um, and again, we'll make this little PowerPoint available for you so you get all of these links. And uh, without any further ado, then I am going to turn it over to Jackie Schweikler. Jackie is a graduate of the Penn State uh, uh, School of Law. And uh, Jackie, I am going to stop sharing and go ahead and let you take over with your presentation. All right, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, can you please confirm that you are yes. seeing my screen? Looking okay. good. Great. Um, all right, then I'll go ahead and get started here. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna talk about is the difference between uh, criminal versus civil liability. Now we all know what criminal liability is. A person is criminally liable when they commit a crime against the public. So if there is a law forbidding an action, for example, something like theft, the lawbreaker will be arrested by the police and charged uh, by the state or the federal government, depending on the crime. The government might require that person to pay a fine or do community service or go to prison, again, uh, depending on the seriousness of the crime. Now, civil liability, that refers to lawsuits brought by a private party. Civil lawsuits often arise from contracts. For example, if two people have a signed uh, agreement and one party fails to complete the agreement, the party that fails to complete the agreement will be liable. The remedy for a contract dispute is usually money. Um, now in an agritourism operation, something like this could arise from disagreements with customers or outside vendors. For example, if you engage in a contract with a food truck operator and then you decide to go with a different vendor, you might be liable. In other words, uh, you might owe the food truck operator compensation, depending on the wording of your contract and what occurred. Now with farm liability, we're gonna focus on liability arising from torts. So what is a tort? A tort is a type of legal action brought in a civil case. Specifically, a tort is an act or omission that results in injury or harm to a person, property, or reputation. Again, that's an act or omission that results in injury or harm to a person, property, or reputation. So what is the purpose of a tort action? Generally, the purpose is to recover damages. In other words, uh, to get money. So here on this slide, we have an example. Uh, Farmer Fred, he has a strawberry operation where he invites the public onto his farm to pick strawberries. Fred allows uh, his pigs to wander the strawberry fields in the evenings. The waste from the pigs uh, contaminates the strawberries and several guests become ill. So what is going to happen to Farmer Fred here? Uh, the strawberries have been contaminated due to Fred's actions. Now, if enough people become sick from the strawberries, uh, there could be criminal charges against Fred. Fred might get community service or jail time or have to pay a fine, sort of depends on the situation here. 
But what about the people who were injured? What do they get? In a criminal case, they'll have the satisfaction of knowing that Fred has been punished, but otherwise they pretty much get nothing. So if the injured people take action and file a civil suit, they'll probably receive financial compensation. They might ask the court to award them medical expenses and lost income. If the court rules in their favor, Farmer Fred will have to pay them this money. Now, with farm liability, we're referring to civil lawsuits, torts, sometimes contracts, and in most cases, uh, when we're talking about damages, we're talking about money. Now, when it comes to a tort, how much proof do you need? On this slide, we're going to do a little comparison. First, as I mentioned before, uh, tort actions are generally going to be civil cases. So an injured person would only need to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the other party is guilty. A preponderance is just a hair more than 50%. In other words, an injured person would need to convince a jury uh, that it's 50.1% certain that the other party caused them injury. That's actually not a ton of proof if you think about it. So in a criminal case, um, we have to prove the defendant uh, is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. You probably heard that before if you've ever watched uh, cop shows. Uh, now that's a much higher standard. And it's important to note that because of this high standard, someone might be found not guilty in a criminal case, but then found guilty in a civil case. For example, let's say that the state brings a criminal lawsuit against uh, Farmer Fred for the contaminated strawberries. The prosecutor, um, however, doesn't do a very good job and they are unable to show that Farmer Fred committed this crime beyond a reasonable doubt. He wasn't able to prove that. Now, one of the victims, um, they could still spring a civil suit against Farmer Fred with the same evidence and win. Um, so to the state, Fred would be not guilty of this criminal action, but at the same time, he might be guilty of the same action in a civil case. So if someone comes to our farm and they're injured, what are they going to ask for in their civil suit? This is a list of some of the, the types of relief that you could expect to see. Like compensatory damages would include medical care or damages for pain and suffering. Uh, pain and suffering is gonna be determined by a jury. Uh, punitive damages, uh, that's, that's pretty rare. Um, these are intended to punish the defendant. Uh, injunctive relief, uh, the court might order, um, issue an order requiring the defendant to cease the activity, to stop whatever they're doing. Um, now, for on-farm injury cases, most of the time we're going to see um, traditional compensatory damages uh, for like medical care, medical care and things like that. Uh, for an agritourism operator, the operator would need to do something pretty uh, terribly uh, harmful, pretty egregious, or continue to repeat the harm despite warnings. Uh, using the strawberry field example, uh, punitive damages uh, could be appropriate. Um, if the farmer were continu uh, to continue to sell those contaminated strawberries. So again, punitive damages, they're rare. You're not gonna see that too often on, on a agritourism operation. Um, it's more likely that in like the Farmer Fred scenario that the court might issue an injunctive uh, relief. You know, They might order Farmer Fred to stop letting the, the pigs wander those fields. Uh, next, I'm gonna go uh, and talk about the three main types of torts negligence, intentional torts, and strict liability. Uh, as I go through these next few slides, uh, think about how these concepts could apply to your operation. The names of the types of torts uh, don't matter as much as uh, understanding you know, your requirements as a farmer and uh, your requirements as a landowner. Um, this is just to give you some perspective so you don't have to memorize any definitions or anything like that. So first, we're gonna talk about negligence as it applies to torts. So what is negligence? Uh, negligence is the failure to act as a reasonable person would act under similar circumstances. Was the person careless or thoughtless? Did they not do something that they should have done? Now, under the negligence theory of liability, there are four factors that a plaintiff would need to prove. First, was there a duty? Was there some obligation, something that the person should have done? Second, and perhaps most importantly, is the question of whether there was a breach of duty. This complicates things a little in that we have to answer a second question, what is the standard of care? At the end of the day, the jury makes the decision on whether your actions were reasonable and whether you breached your duty of care. The last two factors here are a little easier to explain. There's proximate causation, which is about whether the injury is a reasonably foreseeable result of the defendant's misconduct. And lastly, actual damages. 
was the guest or customer actually injured? If your guest um, trips on a rake and breaks their ankle, then the broken ankle ankle is in actual damage. But if the guest, uh, they trip, but then they jump back up to their feet and they don't even have a bruise, maybe there's no actual damage here. Now, in the next few slides, we're gonna talk about each of these factors in more depth. So starting with duty, there are three main ways to tell whether you owe a duty to someone or they owe a duty to you. The first is there's a law about it. Uh, you might have a duty to someone if there is a law, a written law that requires it. For example, um, let's look at Pennsylvania's agritourism um, operations uh, that have petting zoos. So Pennsylvania has a law that requires hand washing stations to be available on animal exhibition grounds. The, the law creates a duty to create these, uh, make these hand washing stations available, and an operator would need to provide this hand washing station. Uh, the next type uh, would be contract duty. Uh, when you enter, enter into a contract with someone, you are agreeing to have a duty to that person. Now, let's say that Farmer Fred invites me to his orchard uh, to visit just as a friend. On my way to his house, um, I see that a pair of gardening shears has been left open on one of the steps in like a high traffic area where a guest or customer could easily step on those shears and trip or get cut. Now, I could just very easily pick them up, put them on like a nearby workbench, get them out of the way, but I don't have to do that. I have no duty to Farmer Fred. Now, if Farmer Fred and I had signed a contract that I would work for him in his apple picking operation, then yes, I would be obligated. Um, I would have a duty to make sure that guests who come to pick apples would be safe. Uh, the third here is assumption of duty. Now, let's just say here that while I'm visiting Farmer Fred, he needs to go work on something in one of the distant fields. So I'm, while I'm waiting for him, I see that the barn has caught on fire. Again, if I'm just a visitor, I have no obligation to do anything. But let's say that I'm feeling ambitious. So I grab a fire extinguisher and I start to put out the flames. I get pretty much all the fire out, but not all of it. There's still a little bit going there in the corner. Then I, and you know, as I'm going, uh, I get a phone call from my bank. And rather than continue to put out the last little bit of flames there, I decide to take the call and I wander off to go talk to my banker. Um, and the barn, you know, the flames reignite, the rest of the barn burns down. If I had ignored the fire and done nothing, I would have owed nothing to Farmer Fred. Um, I could have sat outside and roasted marshmallows and I, it, you know, it wouldn't have been a problem. But because I started to put out the fire, I therefore assumed a duty to help by failing to put out the entire fire, especially when it would not have been dangerous for me to do so, I abandoned my duty and I was probably negligent in these actions. So what's interesting about duty is that it depends on the person who's bringing the lawsuit. If the person who's uh, trying to sue you is a trespasser, you don't owe them as much as you would owe a person you've invited to your home. There are generally three types of persons you'll see on your property, trespassers, licensees, and invitees. Uh, so a trespasser, that everyone knows what a trespasser is, it's someone who enters your property without permission. Um, as a landowner, your obligation is to not maliciously injure that person. Now by maliciously injure, we mean that you can't deliberately hurt trespassers. You can't create traps on your property by jerry-rigging some dangerous weapons together to harm someone that might come by in the night. This one surprises people sometimes. Uh, they say like, but they were trespassing. Uh, you still can't set a dangerous trap for them. Uh, the bottom line here is if you're worried about trespassers or people breaking into your business, buy an alarm, set up a video camera, you, you can't do traps. Uh, the next one is licensee. This is a person who enters your property with permission. These are your friends, these are your family, people you're inviting over for tea. Um, a landowner needs to warn of dangerous conditions. Uh, for example, if you have dangerous animals or if the front porch step is, is loose or broken in some way, you have to warn those people. You, you owe them a duty of, of warning, essentially. Now, most important to us is an invitee. Uh, and an invitee is a person who enters for the benefit of the landowner uh, for a business purpose. Um, the landowner is obligated to make the premise safe or warn of conditions that cannot be repaired. Now, in most cases, you don't need to worry about lawsuits from trespassers. You also probably don't need to worry about lawsuits from your friends and family. You do, however, need to think about the possibility of lawsuits from business invitees. Um, what you need to know here is that you must make the property safe or 
If it can't be fixed, you must warn of the danger. In other words, if you have that broken porch step, fix it. If you can't fix it because you ordered the replacement two by fours and they won't be in until next week, then you need to warn every single business guest that approaches that step. You need to tell them, hey, that's broken, watch your step. Um, maybe the broken step looks very obvious to you and you think like, everyone's gonna see that. Like, I don't have to warn anyone. Well, first of all, never assume what people will see or what they won't see. You might have guests who are visually impaired or something like that. Um, keeping the premises safe uh, for your business invitees is a very high standard. Uh, you need to be vigilant and review your property and your equipment routinely. So we know there's a different uh, duty owed to licensees, invitees, and trespassers. What about child trespassers? This is relevant if there are local kids that might try to sneak onto your property after business hours, but it could also be relevant if your business caters to children and if you've got a large sprawling property where a child might wander off into areas that are only meant for staff. And that's where we get to attractive nuisance. Um, an attractive nuisance is something that could be dangerous and might look fun to a kid. For example, ponds, machinery, and animals. Kids love climbing on tractors. They love petting animals. But if a neighbor kid trespasses and climbs onto your tractor um, or you know, starts the tractor and drives around with it and then falls off and gets injured, you might be liable for that. Conversely, if an adult does something uh, that, that dumb, well, it might be the adult's fault. Um, the question is whether it would be reasonably foreseeable that a child would come onto your property to play with whatever it is. The best way to address this is to think about what a child could potentially get into and try to fix it or prevent it. So, you know, if you've got tractors that are out, in a, um, you know, that you leave out of the barn, um, don't leave the keys in the tractors. Um, and honestly, just lock up all your equipment. Uh, to summarize, when we're trying to determine if we can pursue an action in negligence, we have to see if there's a duty. You owe a different duty to different people. Uh, you owe a lot of duty to a business invitee. You owe some duty to a licensee and to child trespassers. You owe a small amount of duty um, to adult trespassers. The second part of a negligence lawsuit is looking at whether there was a breach of duty. As I mentioned before, this part is a little tricky uh, because we have to first look at the standard of care. The standard of care is what a reasonable person would do under similar circumstances. We're not just looking at the average per person. Uh, so for our purposes, when we're talking about a reasonable person, we're talking about a reasonable farmer, reasonable landowner, or a reasonable business person. Uh, think about something dangerous that you might see on your farm. Now think about how a non-farmer or an inexperienced uh, city slicker might deal with that situation. If you dealt with that situation in the same way that they would deal with that, you might not meet your standard of care. Your actions should be similar to what a normal or reasonable farmer would do in that same situation. Think about what others in your profession would do. When in doubt, reach out to farmers and, and farm organizations and ask. Now there's something, uh, another thing to think about when it comes to breach of duty. Um, on this slide, I have uh, neg uh, information on negligence per se. Now, sometimes it can be difficult to figure out whether or not your actions were a breach of duty, since other farmers and professionals deal with different uh, dangerous situations differently. On the other hand, uh, negligence per se is consistent because it's based on law. So generally, if you are found to have violated any laws, it's negligence per se. Um, negligence per se is where someone violates a law that was written to specifically prevent the kind of damage that was caused by that person's conduct. Let's go back to the petting zoo example with the hand washing station. Let's say that farmer Fiona has an area for kids to pet goats on her Pennsylvania farm. It's a whole, she has an entire petting zoo set up. But Fiona doesn't uh, install a hand washing station, and one of the children contracts E. coli after petting the goats. The law requires a hand washing station near petting zoos specifically to prevent the transfer of disease. Therefore, by not providing a hand washing station, Fiona would fall right into the definition of negligence per se. Now with negligence per se, it's considered an automatic breach of duty and negligent as a matter of law. In other words, by breaking any laws, you're potentially making yourself more susceptible to civil liability lawsuits. For the third factor of negligence, we come to proximate causation. There are two tests. There's the but-for test where 
but for the actions of the defendant, would the injury have occurred? And then second one is, were the defendant's actions a substantial factor in causing the injury? Uh, for proximate causation, the injury must fit one of the two tests and must be reasonably foreseeable result of the defendant's misconduct. So my example here is, uh, let's say that farming, Farmer Larry, he tells a guest to grab a bucket on their way to pick blueberries. He's got a you-pick blueberry operation. Now, as the guest, the guest walks over, reaches for the bucket, they're struck by lightning. They would not have been standing in that spot, but for the instructions uh, from Farmer Larry. As you can see, this would meet the but for test. However, the lightning strike, uh, is it a reasonably foreseeable result of Farmer Larry's instructions? Probably not. Um, I mean, unless there was like a lightning rod near the buckets for some reason, and, but yeah, probably not. So if there's no proximate causation here, there's no negligence. Now in a different, more likely scenario, let's say that Farmer Larry leaves a bunch of tools out on the ground near the blueberry buckets. In this scenario, the guest uh, walks over, trips over the tools on the way to the buckets and the guest tw uh, twists their ankle. Uh, this scenario would probably meet both of the proximate causation tests, but for the tools left on the ground by the farmer, the guest would not have tripped. The tools on the ground are a substantial factor in the guest tripping. And then lastly, we have to ask if the twisted ankle is a reasonably foreseeable result of someone leaving tools on the ground in a walking area. In this scenario, Farmer Larry's actions would very likely be considered proximate causation for this injury. Okay, so when we're talking about actual damages, um, a person could experience an economic loss. Um, you know, they could uh, lose some property. They might require some uh, repairs to the damaged property. They might require medical expenses. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, and some of the damages might include reduced quality of life or pain and suffering. Um, so let's think about that example we just did with Farmer Larry, where the guest tripped and twisted their ankle. In that scenario, the guest is likely to have medical expenses. It's possible they may have property damage too. Maybe they uh, broke their glasses or, or their, their cell phone when they fell. On the other hand, let's say that the guest tripped and stumbled, but they didn't fall and they weren't injured or harmed in any way. While the guest may have experienced some discomfort, it would be hard for them to argue they experienced actual damages. Now, in some situations, the injured party is also at fault for the injury. For example, let's say that a guest, uh, a customer sees that some tools have been left out on the ground, but instead of walking around them very easily, the guest decides to leap over them very dramatically. Now, if you're sued by this business invitee, you could put forward uh, contributory or comparative negligence as a defense. Uh, very, very few states have uh, contributory negligence laws. Under these laws, an injured person uh, who contributes to their injury would not be allowed to recover damages. Again, this is pretty rare. Most states have comparative negligence laws. With comparative negligence, the jury is asked to assign fault between the parties with percentages. Generally, the injured party uh, may still recover damages so long as their negligence uh, is less than that of the defendant. In the example with the tools on the ground, the landowner might be negligent for having left tools in a walkway. But if the jury decides that the injured guest was more negligent, then this defense would apply and the guest would not be able to recover damages. All right, another defense to a negligence lawsuit is assumption of the risk. Uh, participation in an athletic activity assumes the normal risks of the activity. Uh, so assumption of the risk is one of the main defenses in an injury resulting from an activity at an agritourism operation. So as an operator, you can argue that the participants assumed the normal risks of the activity by participating. You could also ask uh, the participants to sign a waiver uh, agreeing to waive liability for risks associated with the activity. Now, if the, if the participants uh, sign this waiver and then try to sue you for an injury that occurs on your farm, you can argue that they waived the right to sue when they signed the waiver. Um, what is a good example of a risk that would not be a normal risk for a farm activity? You know, what's, what's a normal risk for horseback riding? What's a normal risk for apple picking or a normal risk for a hayride? Like for, for apple picking, um, a normal risk might be that an apple could fall out of the tree and hit you in the head. It's a pretty normal risk. Um, 
it wouldn't necessarily be a normal risk for the ladder to break underneath you though, because as a business person, you need to make sure that your equipment is good uh, in good working order. Okay, uh, that's it for negligence. So we are going to now move on to intentional torts. This section is much more straightforward. Only got a, a few slides on this. Uh, so what most people think of when they think of a tort is assault and battery. Um, if someone swings a shovel at me and they hit me, that's a tort. Um, and if they're just swinging a shovel around for fun and uh, they're not paying attention and they hit me by accident, if they hit me, that's a tort too. Um, torts can include other things like false imprisonment, intentional infliction of emotional distress, defamation, and then invasion of privacy and nuisance and trespass. Now, these last two torts are particularly significant in ag agricultural law, so we're going to discuss those now. Now, trespass, uh, you're probably very familiar with this. Anyone owning tens or hundreds of acres of land, uh, they're going to experience trespass at some point. Now, these large areas of land are frequently trespassed upon in a variety of ways. Uh, think about drones. If you fly your drone over my property, that could be several torts, um, invasion of privacy, nuisance, uh, and trespass. Now, trespass is the intentional physical interference with a person or property or intentionally causing something to enter the plaintiff's land. If someone sneaks onto your property at night to do a little stargazing, it's obvious that that person is trespassing. But what if a customer buys a ticket to your operation and they participate in the activities as normal, but then when no one is looking, they walk past a do not enter sign. That person is now trespassing too. Even though they have a ticket, they're, if they go you know, into areas they're not supposed to go into and there's clearly marked signs, that's still trespassing. Uh, when it comes to nuisance, a nuisance is an activity that's designated as harmful uh, or annoying. By definition, nuisance is an, an interference with a person's private use and enjoyment of their land. Uh, if you live in a college town like me, you're familiar with noise complaints. That's, that's nuisance. Now, if you've got loud neighbors whose dogs uh, bark all day long, that's a type of nuisance. For those of you interested in starting up a business on your farm, you need to be on the lookout for potential nuisance claims against your activities. If you're going to do hay rides for kids, that might get loud. Or maybe you plan to play music at events. Uh, or maybe you plan to do late night special events where you bring in lights. Uh, you'll need these very bright lights for parking. All those things could be considered a nuisance. Before you get started, uh, talk to your neighbors. Figure out where you're going to host events and figure out if there could be problems for your neighbors relating to noise, smell, uh, smells, or lighting. Uh, last for this section, uh, let's talk about strict liability. In strict liability cases, the injured party doesn't need to prove that there was negligence or an intent to cause harm. A person can be liable regardless of how careful they were during the activity. In other words, it's easier for an injured person to bring this type of lawsuit. There are generally three scenarios where strict liability would be applied. The first one listed on the slide is animals known to be harmful. If you have a dog on the property that has bitten someone in the past, you could be strictly liable for an injury if that dog were to bite someone again. Now, if you're running a petting zoo or if you have a, any type of animal interactions on your property, uh, this is really important for you to know. So like if an incident ever occurs, make sure that the animal in question is kept away from all guests on the farm or you could be at risk for one of these strict liability lawsuits. Next, uh, strict liability applies to activities that are considered inherently dangerous or ultra hazardous. Um, unless your agritourism operation involves uh, dangerous chemicals or explosions, it's unlikely that you'll need to worry about this one as much. In last on the list, we have products liability. Products liability applies where there is a design defect, manufacturing defect, or problem with the label. In most states, food manufacturers are strictly liable for injuries under products liability laws. For most agritourism operators, uh, products liability will apply to operations that prepare and sell food products. For example, there's potential for a products liability lawsuit where a dairy farmer, um, where you have a dairy farmer and they intend to sell milk or cheese to consumers on the farm. If your business involves selling agricultural produce directly to consumers, you should check out the next webinar in our series, which is called uh, Legal Liabilities in Selling Raw and Processed Specialty Crop Products. Uh, this webinar, again, I think we mentioned it at the beginning, but that's going to be held on March 23rd. More details can be found on our website. All right, moving on to vicarious liability. 
um, an employer is generally liable for torts of an employee that were done with, within the scope of the employment. Um, vicarious liability is the pass the buck rule. So if you have an employee who does something that harms a guest at your farm, you might be subject to vicarious liability. This isn't always the case, but it's something to keep in mind. So when this happens, uh, the injured person can sue you or the employee. If they just sue the employee, the employee can add you to the lawsuit. That doesn't mean that the employee is completely safe from the lawsuit. This just means the injured person um, can get money from both of you or either of you. The best way to deal with this is to make sure your employees are thoroughly trained in your regular meetings. Um, know that in interns and volunteers will count as employees in this, in this scenario. And um, on the other hand, if you have uh, independent contractors, make sure that they have insurance or talk to them about getting an indemnity agreement. Now you can never completely protect yourself from being sued, but there are some steps you can take to mitigate potential problems. I'm gonna talk about each of these um, uh, protections pretty briefly over the next few slides, liability insurance, entity formation, and state liability legislation. Uh, when it comes to notice of risk and waivers, depending on the state, that might tie into state legislation. Now, if you wanna protect yourself from a liability lawsuit, the first thing that you should look into is liability insurance. Chances are you already have farm insurance, but your traditional farm insurance is unlikely to cover the special situations that might arise uh, depending on your operation. Uh, in addition, your municipality may require you to get specific insurance relating to the activity, um, or, or maybe you'll have to choose your own insurance. If so, uh, the cost is going to be your main focus, of course. Uh, you have to decide you know, how much protection do you need? How much do you wanna spend? How much can you afford to spend? Um, it's very important for you to talk to your insurance company. Make sure they know exactly what kind of operation you plan to run. Make sure that the company understands everything that's involved and that they can cover you. Um, it might be a very long conversation and they might um, even send someone out to check out your property. Um, some activities that may seem normal to you might not be normal to your insurance company. Um, my favorite example here is the pumpkin cannon at Peak and Peak Resort in Clymer, New York. Uh, there's, there's no cookie cutter form for pumpkin cannon, I'm, I'm sure of it. Now, if the worst comes to pass and one of your guests is injured, you wanna make sure that you have everything documented ahead of time. Keep track of when you do inspections. Uh, you can make a chart and have employees sign their initials after they check the machinery. Uh, you can make a checkup calendar for items that need to be routinely replaced or cleaned. Uh, if there's an injury from a piece of equipment, the insurance company is going to want to know when the machine was purchased and when it was last serviced or inspected. In other words, get your paperwork in order. Uh, the next most important thing is to make sure that you call your insurance company as soon as possible after an incident. Don't wait a week to call. Even if you're not sure about whether or not there's going to be a lawsuit, give your insurance company a call, make sure they know about the situation. Uh, the second thing that you should consider um, to protect yourself from liability is entity formation. There are a few different types of entities that could help prevent a significant personal loss in the event of an injury-related lawsuit. You'll probably wanna to talk to an attorney to figure out which of these makes the most sense for your operation. Uh, so we've got partnership, which creates a separate entity. It's relatively easy to establish. Um, incomes reported on individual tax returns. The downside is that it doesn't offer liability protection. You could also create a corporation this is a separate entity. There's more formalities in creation and management. Um, it does offer liability protection. And another bonus is that the ownership interest is transferable. You can also do an LLC or limited liability company. Uh, this again, creates a separate entity. It's taxed as a partnership. It also offers liability protection. Um, you could also do you know, sole proprietorship. Um, no separate entity is formed, uh, no liability pr uh, protection, and income is reported on individual tax returns. As you might have noticed, uh, not all of the entities I mentioned on the previous slide offer liability protection. If your goal is liability protection, you should look into creating a corporation or an LLC. Um, now, so to me, the decision to form an entity boils down to the four considerations listed on this slide. Uh, liability protection, uh, taxation, the amount of difficulty you'll face in filing the paperwork, and generational planning. Now, transferability is important if you're planning to tie your agritourism operation to your farm. If you know you're going to pass down the family farm, 
think about how you're also going to pack, pass down the agritourism business. Uh, and for those of you seriously considering entity formation, if you haven't done it yet, but you're considering it, I recommend checking out the next webinar in this series, which will be held on April 12th or April, April 6th. Um, I only have these two slides on entity formation. So if this is something that you'd like to learn more about, definitely check out the business structures webinar on April 6th. Uh, I briefly mentioned waivers a few slides ago, but it's important enough to repeat here. I just wanna make sure that it's clear in order to use assumption of the risk as a defense, the participant needs to actually know that they're assuming the risk. To prove to the court that someone assumed the risk, you need to have uh, some sort of structure in place to notify all participants that they've assumed the risk. One method is to post signs that say, all participants assume the risks associated with this agritourism activity. Another method is to hand each participant a flyer or ticket that says they assume the risk. Those are good options, but the best option, um, the best defense that you could show the court would be a signed waiver. This isn't practical for every operation, but it's definitely worth you know, considering. When it comes to state laws, I wanna show you some examples. Uh, not all states have these types of laws and what they have is going to be a little different between each state. As you can see on the slide, I'm gonna discuss Pennsylvania law, but some of the concepts here will still apply to other operations. So uh, liability statutes, there are, um, there are uh, specific to agritourism uh, liability statutes in a number of states. So typically one of these agritourism liability protection statutes, uh, they're going to limit the liability of an agritourism operator. That means if someone is injured on an agritourism operator's property, the injured person generally cannot sue the operator for any injuries sustained from an inherent risk in the activity. As an example, I ask on this slide, uh, what would it be an inherent risk at an animal petting zoo? I think most of us can assume that an animal might bite or kick or even knock you down. Inherent risks are things that should be obvious to anyone in the business. So on June 30th, 2021, um, HB 101 was signed into law as Pennsylvania's Agritourism Activity Protection Act. This act became effective at the end of August last year. Now this new law grants an agritourism activity provider liability protection from civil liability for injury or damages sustained by a third party participant in an agritourism activity. Um, please note that this law does not apply to all agritourism activities. So Pennsylvania's, um, this law is different from every other state agritourism liability statute in a few significant ways. Um, so unlike every other state, uh, Pennsylvania specifically excludes liability protections for injuries that occur during weddings or concerts. So an operator who moved to Pennsylvania recently or someone who has a business operating under one of these statutes in a different state, they might assume that like something like a barn wedding would be covered. Uh, barn weddings are specifically not covered here. In addition, uh, Pennsylvania's act will not apply to injuries sustained during overnight stays or as a result of food and beverage services. Okay, so in order to receive liability protection, uh, an operator needs to meet all four of these key elements of the statute and I go over these in the next few slides. So the first element that must be met in order for this liability protection to apply is that the injury must occur while the visitor is participating in an activity that meets the definition of agritourism under the law. Um, I'm not gonna read this entire slide, but as you can see from the slide, this is a pretty broad definition. And unlike some states, it doesn't highlight a specific activity to protect. Um, in other words, this should pretty much cover anything remotely considered agritourism, minus the exceptions we talked about earlier. And the second requirement or element number two is that the agritourism activity must occur on land used for so-called normal agricultural operations. For the definition of normal agricultural operation, we go to Pennsylvania's right to farm law. Uh, again, I'm not gonna read the definition here, but you, it generally states that a normal agricultural operation is an activity or procedure used by a farmer for production of poultry livestock and for the production of crops. Now this definition is pretty, also pretty broad and applies to most farms that grow produce or raise animals. Uh, that said, this definition also requires the farm to encompass at least 10 acres or if less than 10 acres, uh, the farm must generate an annual income of $10,000 or more. 
Uh, the third element, element in Pennsylvania statute is that the visitor must sign an agreement to waive liability before they engage in the agritourism activity. This is going back to waivers like we talked before. So very generally, this waiver agreement says, I understand that the agritourism provider is not liable for any injury to a participant resulting from an agritourism, agritourism activity. I accept all risks. Uh, please note at point number one, there's no liability protection for the agritourism provider if they act in a grossly negligent manner on purpose or criminally. Now, if you just thought to yourself, getting people to sign a waiver might be difficult for my operation, there's an alternative. Pennsylvania statute allows agritourism operators to print that same agreement and warning language onto a ticket. Uh, two things about the ticket. The ticket must include the same language and guests will have to use the ticket to enter the activity. Operators will still need to make sure that they're filtering their guests uh, to the entrance in a way that uh, they can check to make sure that everyone has this ticket. The fourth requirement for Pennsylvania statute refers to signage. The required warning signs must be posted on the property at conspicuous locations and must be at least three feet by two feet in size. Uh, the signs should be placed in a way so they're easily, uh, easily observed by the participants while they're participating. Um, the language here just warns the participants to read the agreement provided by the operator on their ticket. And the sign explains to participants that the operator will not be liable for injuries should the participant be hurt while they're on the farm. The last thing I want to note with this law is that the law states that a parent or guardian must sign the acknowledgement agreement on behalf of a minor or care dependent person. Um, generally, children do not have a legal capacity to sign liability waivers, and a waiver signed by a child might be voidable. And that's going to be up to Pennsylvania courts to decide, um, and, and they're going to decide whether or not this law is going to have the intended effect when it comes to claims of injuries to minors. Uh, it's an unsettled legal issue, and we're just going to have to wait and see how the courts deal with this aspect of the law. Now, that said, a parent's signed waiver would waive the parent's claim for compensation relating to their child. Um, if you're interested in reading these for yourself, I have the links here, um, and some helpful information is listed on the Farm Bureau website for those of you who are interested in this uh, obtaining this type of signs, signage. Uh, the next law that you should keep in mind is right to farm. Uh, we're running low on time here, so I'm not going to go uh, too in depth here, but I will note that we have a presentation coming up on December 14th that will talk about right to farm. So if you're interested in knowing more about right to farm, uh, check out that webinar on December 14th. Uh, again, the, uh, the, the point of right to farm is to encourage the development and improvement of agricultural land and reduce the loss of resources to the Commonwealth by limiting the circumstances under which an operation can be sued. Um, the point is that you're trying to avoid unreasonably interfering with your, your neighbor's property. Um, we have to weigh the benefits of the activity against any harm caused by the activity. All right, so this is, uh, on this slide, we're talking about how we're limiting nuisance actions against uh, normal agricultural operations. And we actually went over normal agricultural operations a few slides ago. So uh, we already talked about this a little bit, which is nice. Okay, another Pennsylvania statute that could apply to an agritourism operation is Pennsylvania's Equine Activity Immunity Act. Um, obviously, this law is only, only going to provide protection for agritourism activities involving horses, but it's a powerful law for those in the business. I'm going to skip over these slides because, again, we're running out of time, and I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, and again, you can find these slides on the website. I believe they're already posted. All right, so what if you're unable to meet the requirements to get liability protection under those other statutes? Uh, you still have some hope with the Recreational Use of Land and Water Act, known as RULA. Um, RULA applies to landowners who allow the public onto their land for recreational use. Um, and, you know, farmers and landowners uh, with agritourism, they allow the public onto their land uh, for recreational use. Um, this limits, liabilities, uh, limits liability to landowners who qualify. It does this by lowering the duty of care owed by a landowner. So the landowner does not need to inspect their property or warn. The duty of care is the same as a, the duty owed to a trespasser. Again, I'm going to have to skip through these. Uh, Brooke already mentioned the mediation program, but you know, if none of these statutes work out for you and you still get sued, uh, you can always ask for mediation through the mediation program, uh, and hopefully we can resolve this out of court for you. 
Uh, all right, so I hope I've given you a few things to think about. On this slide, I've made a checklist of the types of things that you should already be doing or should consider doing in the future. Um, if you don't already have warning signs, you should put those up. Uh, if you you know if you haven't run, looked at it recently, review your insurance policies. Uh, if you're interested in forming an entity, you know attend that webinar, uh, look into forming an entity, talk to a lawyer, um, put up assumption of the risks notices. Uh, have your guests sign waivers and make sure you're doing those weekly and daily checks. Uh, now, the last thing I would like, if you haven't already, please fill out this survey. If you are a producer, I promise if you give us your email, we won't sell it or give it away. Uh, we'd like to follow up with you in a few months to check in and see how things are going for you. Uh, so I think the link should be in the chat, but for those of you with smartphones, what you can do is you can turn on your camera on your smartphone, just hold it up to the screen. And with the camera on, a, click, a clickable link will pop up that you can follow to the survey. The link to the survey, again, I think it's already in the chat, um, but it only take a few minutes. So please fill out the survey for us. And I think I've destroyed our ability to answer too many questions. So uh, if you'd like to, if you have some questions and they haven't been answered in the Q&A, please feel free to send me an email. Uh, Brooke, was there anything that, you know, did we get a, a brief question that we'd be able to you know, run through the answer quickly. Is there anything? We do like have that? one question and I'm just going to read this because this is the first time that I'm reading it all the way through. Okay. Okay. Great. Someone says, uh, uh, and I got to see if this up, I think Ross may have already answered that one. Um, okay. I'll, I'll mention the uh, couple of insurance points and, and, and also about the minors with the uh, immunity statute that was passed last year. Basically, um, we know that the law has always been that minors can't execute a waiver, you know, so that's why the parent is asked. You go to a ski resort, you go to a snow tubing, you, your child wants to play, uh, you know, soccer, whatever it is, you know the forms, you've seen them a million times. Um, you know, they ask the parent to sign. The problem is that there is really no way that that issue can ever be, or I'll put it this way, there is no uh, forum for deciding whether that's going to be an effective uh, uh, waiver as to the child's injury claim until a lawsuit is filed. And then that waiver is essentially made part of evidence for a judge to decide whether it was effective. And thus far, after you know, 250 plus years of Pennsylvania courts uh, issuing written opinions, uh, there is no law to indicate that that would ever be effective because there is such a body of case law in Pennsylvania that essentially says that other than through a formal court proceeding, a minor's claim cannot be waived, compromised, settled, et cetera, even by the parent. So therefore, signing these documents uh, when your child goes to play soccer or whatever it is, is essentially uh, a, uh, it's not a futile effort, but it's certainly not something that's going to, uh, is anticipated by most practicing lawyers to hold any water. And so now, is it a, is it, uh, a good idea to do those things anyway? Yes. Because if you are in the practice of doing waivers and that sort of thing, that is good evidence. It may not win the case for you and have it and get the case thrown out, but it's good evidence that uh, the parties, particularly the parents involved, knew that, for example, a child was potentially going to encounter some degree of risk by doing the agritourism activity that was uh, that caused them ultimately injury of some kind. And so it is good evidence. It, it, it doesn't win you the case when you're dealing with a minor who was injured, even when the parent signs, but it's still worth doing. Your insurance company will appreciate that you did such things. Other things that are great evidence uh, that are excellent to do are things like Jackie mentioned, the signage. I can't tell you, I was a liability defense attorney defending cases back in my very early days. I can't tell you how good it was to have a file where you had signs that said, you know, be careful here, watch out for this here, you know, risk of injury here, whatever, you know, you need to tailor them to your individual circumstances. But I can't tell you how helpful that is as a simple and inexpensive step. So um, I think we are kind of out of time, yeah. it being 102. 
Um, and I think we pretty much uh, have the answers uh, here. Again, appreciate everybody attending. And our next session will be the March 23rd on, uh, it'll be on liability arising from the sale of your product. So again, this was about when the customer comes to your property and something happens while they're there. Now we're going to talk about when your product leaves your property and goes with the customer someplace and presumably they consume it and then something happens. Foodborne illness is a giant uh, issue right now, and it will continue to be. And, uh, you know, the, the same attorneys that advertise on the billboards are taking in the foodborne illness cases also. It's not just motorcycle cases or whatever else they're advertising for. Um, you know, foodborne illness is a, a major growth area in that uh, uh, field. So it's important to understand these things, and your insurance coverage doesn't always provide you with what you think it provides you. Uh, so we'll talk all about that at the next session, March 23rd. Spread the word to other growers and producers. Um, you know, we'd like to get as many people in this as possible, and we can begin to have, uh, you know, sort of a, a more free-flowing free atmosphere and, and, and exchange with our, you know, attendees. Uh, and again, it doesn't matter that they missed the first one. They can always go back and watch it. We'll have recordings available for them. So Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for attending. We'll see you at uh, topic number two on March 23rd.